over each and every one of us. Amen. Morning. We're in our thanks, John. We're in our second week of our series, uh, Fully Present. And as I mentioned last week, um, this is a series that will build on itself. So uh, if you missed last week, I encourage you to go watch last week's message. Um, fully engaged in this one. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about what are the things that keep us from being fully present with God, with ourselves, and with others at the same time, figuring out what are some things we can do to remain present with God, with ourselves, and with others around us. So as we get started, I want you to imagine yourself, are there any scuba divers in the house? All right, so a handful of you. So when you go scuba diving, or you wanna go explore what's underneath um, the waters, I know one of the things you do is tether yourselves to the boat in some fashion. You have some idea of what you're gonna do. And so you get all your equipment, you know where you wanna go, imagine yourself out there, and you jump in. My question though, just backing up just a little bit, do you stop the boat or not? It kinda seems like a dumb question, but you think about it, do you stop the boat or not? That's a given, that if you're gonna go explore and that's the vehicle, that brought you there, that's the one's gonna take you back, that you're gonna actually stop the boat. See, but I think we don't do that in life necessarily. We want to explore, we wanna go deep, and then we just jump off, we just go in. And what happens though, if the boat is moving at a high velocity, and you're wanting to go deep, and you're tethered to this boat, what happens is you just get dragged on top of the water, constantly being slapped all the way across as you're being pulled. So it seems like a dumb question, you're like, well, duh. Yes, you would stop the boat. But I think we need to learn to do that in our own lives. It doesn't matter what we really wanted, where our intentions were. There's some things that actually need to happen in our lives. And part of what we've been talking about is learning how to slow down and stopping if needed. See, only when we're fully present with God, with ourselves and others, do we, do we really begin to experience what he wants for us. And like we talked about last week, it's not about our, our crazy, busy schedules, but it's about the busyness and restlessness within our own souls. We established last week that being busy in itself is not a bad thing. In many ways, we're all busy. It's when we get hurried and running through whatever to-do list and everything we have to get done in life. See, busy is simply being engaged in some kind of activity, and we have that. And it's good for us to reflect though, at what speed are we engaging these activities that are before us every day. The hurriness can have a devastating effect on our psyche, on our emotions, relationships, our bodies, keeping us from being fully present. <clears throat> In many ways, being fully present is about being aware of what's happening in and around us. It's not about compartmentalizing our lives, which many of us are experts at, but it's really about being cognizant of the areas in our lives that still need healing, that still need to mature in order for us to continue to grow in Christ. See, unless we're aware of these areas, which by the way, we all have them, we're never really gonna grow. We're not gonna mature. You can jump from Bible study to church to church to different groups and everything else and then just still carry the same stuff within you that you never healed from. Because either we're, we're too hurried and in this case, we're too distracted. We have to learn to slow down and focus. And that's so hard in, in this culture. As I think about being fully present, it has to do a lot with our focus, or lack of it, for that matter. There's a battle on all levels, a ferocious competition for our attention. It's all around us. 
the distractions in our lives are real. Distractions not only rob us of our focus, but they can rob us of our ability to become who God wants us to be. For example, <clears throat> let's say you want to spend some quality time with your son or your daughter, but you're constantly looking at your phone. Yes, yeah, sweetie, I see that. That's great. And you're just doing your thing because you're expecting that all-important email or text to come through. Or you're engaging with someone else, thinking you're spending the time that you want with that person. But the reality is you're distracted. And it's keeping you from being fully present with your son, with your daughter. And it's also preventing you from being the kind of father or mother that you want to be. It's not the phone's fault. It's our inability to focus. Focusing means saying yes to something for that moment and no to every other distraction in that time span. I wonder if this has ever happened to you. You know you have to finish, you have a deadline at work and all of a sudden your computer, you get a notification and all of a sudden you're 85 minutes later, you're still on Facebook or on stupid TikTok watching somebody dance, eat, or say something, and you're laughing, you're thinking, you're like, oh my gosh, it's been an hour and a half. Where has the time gone? Has this ever happened to you? You just get lost watching kitten videos or whatever it is you do that you really enjoy, you got super distracted. There's an algorithm on you and what you stuff that you watch, and they know how to get us, but all of a sudden, you were distracted. I was on the phone with someone else the other day, and they said to me, hey, I need to get off the phone real quick. As um, they were walking into the grocery store, said, I really need to focus right now. The person was fully aware of what they needed in order to go through that grocery store at a pretty quick pace. See, being focused will set us free to be present at a deeper level, period. Distractions don't always come by way of technology, and I'm going to pick on technology here in a little bit, but it comes also in forms of urgent matters, and this happens. You're sitting at home, you're watching the Astros, and then something comes up, someone comes downstairs and says, hey, I need your help, and suddenly they need your time, they need your energy, they need your money, they need your expertise, whatever it may be, and just like that, you seem distracted. At work, I'll be sitting here, and all of a sudden, there's a knock at my door, and the famous phrase, hey, just real quick. And, then, <laughs> and just like that, all focus is gone, right, Stacy? Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's gone. Our folk, and studies show that in order for you to reach that flow of focus that you've had, it takes about 20 minutes to get back there for uninterrupted focus. The amount of energy that it takes to get there. Our inability to remain focused can have devastating effects. It can prevent us from knowing who we are right now, who we're to become, and what we're supposed to be doing. The author of Stolen Focus, Jonathan Hari, writes, you can become lost in your own life. Our focus can have huge ramifications on how we're present in this life. If we need to understand, I think it's important for us to understand the value of our attention. And when you would grasp that, to be able to guard it, to protect it. Because we will become, as a person, what we pay attention to. Think about it. You will become what you pay attention to. We have been created with an incredible capacity to focus, unlike any other created being. However, in this brokenness within us and in this world, because of sin, it, it begins to push us to the brink of utter, complete, and constant distraction, especially in this day and age. So going back to our phones, how many of us just turn to our phones because we're bored? How many of you give these to your kids because they're bored? Like, sh shoot, I don't have to talk to them or cook for them or any, like, here, just go. And we give them our phones as a way of just killing distraction. And we allow these things to rule our lives. We turn to them when we're in an uncomfortable situation just disengage a little bit. You go to the grocery store, you're pushing your cart, you stop, what do you do? Like, I don't know what people are doing, but this is what they're doing. You feel like a complete moron if you just stand there. If I see someone standing there not on their phone, what, what do you do? I call the manager, call SWAT, something, he's, that person is up to something 
bad because they're not on their phone. It's just we've bought into society that this is what we do. We go to the doctor's office. We're sitting there. I'm just going to sit down, and I'm just going to pull my phone out, and I'm going to sit here and just do this. Period is what we do. It's our phone. Elevator. So I don't have to look at the person. How many people have run into you, have you run into at the mall because you're on your stupid phone? Are you like, seriously? You get to the red light and that is extra time on your phone. Do y'all know that? You can be more effective when you pull up to a red light, pull out your phone. I was sitting on the lane going straight. There's a turn lane right here, four cars back. People are super polite. The light has turned green. Three cars went. My light's still red. I look over, this car is not moving. No one's honking. So I honk after the light turns red, like, move up. The lady's like, like, I am sorry, I interrupted you for being on your phone. And everybody's okay with it. We're okay just simply getting interrupted by phones all the time. We turn to our phones to be entertained. We're in a board meeting. We turn to our phones. Listening to the preacher, we turn to our phones. <laughs> We're always turning to our phone. The average iPhone user touches, so Android people, you're off the hook. <laughs> iPhone users touch their phones 2,617 times a day. That's crazy. If you think about it. It was like, uh, wine's just once. I just hold it all day. <laughs> you know, it's like, but I think when we turn to it and turn it on, a recent study in reviews.org reveals that 89% of Americans say that they check their phones within the first 10 minutes of waking up. I think that's too much time. 75% of Americans feel uneasy leaving their phone at home. 75 Americans, you're like, well, I'm Mexican, so no, it's, I think it's people living here. 75% of Americans check their phones within five minutes of receiving a notification. 75% use their phone while going to the bathroom. Hopefully not FaceTime. 69% <laughs> have texted someone in the same room they were in with. 69%, I'm sorry, 60% sleep with their phone at night. Aww. <laughs> 57% consider themselves addicted to their phones. 55% say they have never gone longer than 24 hours without their cell phone. 47% of people say they feel a sense of panic or anxiety when their cell phone battery goes less than what? 20%. If I lose my phone, if it dies, 46% use their phone while on a date, and 27% use their phone while driving, and those are the only ones that confess to it. <laughs> I think that last one's a lie, because according to another study, it reveals that 8 to 9% of all fatal crashes are attributed to distracted drivers. Distraction kills. Distracted driving is the number one growing cause of death around the world right now. Because we think it's no big deal, it's just a quick text. I'm just going to check real quick, pull up a, a book or a song, an album or whatever. You think we got this until we don't. A study from Forbes magazine reveals that taking your eyes off the road for five seconds, moving at 55 miles per hour is equivalent to traveling the length of a football field without looking. And we think distractions are no big deal. They're all sorts of distractions. They're visual, uh, uh, visual distractions. There are manual distractions around us, cognitive distractions. But I believe all of them have spiritual implications for us at so many different levels. See, it's not all about the phone or technology. It's easy to say it's all out there. But I'm focusing on a phone. Anybody here not have a phone in this room? Just like, it'd be easier to ask that. Like, like everyone not have a phone at all. You don't have one at home, so we can't call you? You never have a phone? You, know, you have a landline, but you have, a, all right, a landline. Respect, brother. All right. What is a landline? No, it's not. <laughs> 
All right, so for us, here, here's the thing. This is so prevalent. There is nothing like this that has hit humanity ever. So people who study this stuff, they're looking at, at what else in, in humanity has had this kind of effect. They can't think of anything. Maybe money that we've been so attached to something. But we never went to sleep with our purses and wallets. Well, now kind of maybe because you can pay with this stupid thing now and everything else. Some of the younger folks in here, you've grown up always having a phone. Like I have a brother and I have a phone. Like it is, it just comes with the package. It is. You don't know life without this. Those of us like, well, I grew up, I didn't have, I had a landline. Like, <laughs> we had pigeons, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's the way we communicated. But these kids don't know, they have a computer at their fingertips with an app called phone that they sometimes use. But we use it for so many other things, integrated to all of our lives, supposed to make it easier, many ways it does, and, and yet it is the number one contributor to our distractions. I think these phones are a visual representation of our inner struggle and clutter of our souls. I think this, we need to be careful. And I pick on phones, but it comes out in so many different ways. A study commissioned by Hewlett Packard. Um, <laughs> okay, a study commissioned by Hewlett Packard found technological distractions. Uh, who is it? Yeah, can, can I call you back? Sorry, it'll just be one second, y'all. Yeah, I'm kind of in the middle of something. No, I already passed that part. Okay. All right. I, I love you too, buddy. All right. You be good. Bye, Ray. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we, we have accepted that as the fabric of our relationships as no big deal. Just real quick. We've accepted interruptions at every level, at whatever it takes. This is what we do. In many ways, this is who we've become. For us to sit still and to interact and to look at someone's eyes is almost something that has passed. We need to figure out how to recapture that. We're so easily distracted, it's dangerous. A study commissioned by Hewlett Packard found technological distractions cause a drop in the worker's IQ by 10 points. That's double the points in contrast to someone smoking cannabis at work. So what I got out of it is you're better getting stoned um, than checking your Facebook at work. Don't do either, I'm just saying, all right? Don't check your social media or get stoned, period, all right? But it has an effect on us, double the IQ points. Anyways, think about all the things in life you pay attention to. That's going to require a little bit of focus to even think about what you actually pay attention to. There's so many different things that demand our attention, our undivided attention. Do you know what they are? And I love when people say, like, well, I multitask. No, you don't. You don't multitask. That is a phrase that was used to describe the processes computers do, and we started describing that to human beings. The reality is you are on a task, you stop, and then you can start another one. You might do that very quickly, and we call that multitasking, but really you are single tasking, just back and forth really fast, quickly. This is what we do, but we think that we can do these focused tasks simultaneously, and our minds weren't created to do that. We were created to concentrate for us to be present with God will require focus of us. Contrast this to Psalm 16, verse 8. He says, I have set the Lord always before me, says the psalmist. I have set the Lord always before me. And I, and I wondered, as, as I read this, what if we were to say it the other way? I have set blank always before me. What would you fill in the blank with? I know we're in church, we're supposed to say Jesus, right? But really, what do you set before your mind always? Are you even cognizant? Are you aware of what you actually put before your mind always? 
I wonder, what, what if we were to reach for the Lord in the same manner that we reached for our phones? Constantly wondering. Could we do that? It's good for, for us to ask ourselves, what are we focusing on? What is stealing your focus? It's good to say stealing because it makes it sound like I don't have responsibility. What am I abdicating my focus to? Focus is a state of mind in which our minds, body, emotions, and spirit all align. When one of those is off, it is really difficult for us to focus. Focus is the convergence of attention, clarity, understanding, and awareness aligning. Yet we're so easily distracted. We're talking about something and it's squirrel. And then we just go off on a tangent and we start talking about something else. And this happens when we're writing. This happens when we're conversing. We're in meetings and we lose sight. And it's one thing, which by the way, have I told you about the squirrels in our attic? Let's <laughs> joke. All over the place. And then we wonder why we're so tired and worn out. It's really tough to stay mentally focused, especially if you're ruminating about the past, worrying about the future, or tuned out to the present moment for whatever reason. We can try to blame everything else around us, but the reality is when we really stop and focus, we begin to see that there are things in here. See, being fully present is about being able to put aside all other distractions whether they're physical like the phone or psychological like our anxieties and being fully engaged in the moment we're in. And in order to get to that point, we need to slow down enough, stop so that we can dive deep within our souls. Looking within is going to require an incredible amount of focus on our behalf. And for some of us, we may need the help of others to really begin this journey. Scripture warns us about the importance of focusing our minds. And this focusing that we're talking about is really a spiritual battle, and it takes place in our minds. This is what the Apostle Paul writes in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. In other words, we will wage war, but not as the world does. Not in our own strength, not according to our own resources, but make no mistake about it, there is a battle, and we will wage war. He continues in verse 4. But the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We have weapons, resources at our disposal to combat and obliterate strongholds. But it begs the question, what are strongholds? You're like, yeah, let's get them. Let's destroy them. Like, what are they? I don't even know what strongholds are. What are you talking about? Like, I came to Christ. Everything's fine. He is talking to Christians about the need to obliterate strongholds. A stronghold can be described as a mental block or as an argument, if you will, that has been formed against the will and word of God. It, essentially, it's a lie of some kind usually mixed in with truth, that we've built up over time and we subscribe to it that, Im that impacts the way that we're present in this life. Arguments are developed and held in the mind. Strongholds are in our minds. I think many times we think of strongholds out there. Our ability to direct our focus is in our minds. This is where the battle takes place, y'all. My question is, how do you know what your strongholds are? Because if I always assume that I'm right and everyone else is wrong, I'll never identify them. I'll just continue to live life assuming that I'm right and everybody else is wrong or crazy. But when I actually slow down, then I'm able to identify what is happening within. What are the things and patterns of thinking that have been established that prevent me from being present with God, with myself, and with others. See, if we live hurried and distracted lives, we'll never know. 
Strongholds have a way of showing up in our lives in a way that are undetectable to us. Sometimes they're generational. It's the way families have just thought and lived life. Distractions can lead us to develop all kinds of strongholds manifested in our worldviews, in our behaviors, our attitudes. The way you view life can be considered a stronghold. For instance, if you think that life is all about acquiring possessions and being successful, then you will conduct yourself a certain way. That becomes a, a stronghold for you. If you think that life is all about the pursuit of your personal happiness and fulfillment, then you're going to conduct yourself and do certain things because of what you think about these things. Your worldview, whether you like it or not, know it or not, will determine the way that you're present or not in this life. You may not be aware of the underlying focus that is directing your life. That's part of the need for us to slow down. Or take an attitude, for instance. Worry, stress, anxiety, fear, all of those can be strongholds. Seeking the approval of others can become a stronghold. that thing that seems front and center of your life, those things that compete to consume for our attention. Guilt, resentment, unforgiveness, insecurity it becomes the lens through which you view everything. That's a stronghold. And they will prevent us from being and experiencing everything God has for us. This is a spiritual war. The tools have been given to us. The weapons have been given to us. But he's saying, I need you to slow down. I need you to focus. See, the enemy of God takes advantage of our distractions, plants those seeds, and those strongholds begin to be formed in, in us. Continues in verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's what strongholds do. They're, they're opposing, they're resisting God. And again, we destroy arguments. Where are they? In our mind. Lofty opinions when we think that we know better than or God's word didn't mean this and meant this. And we've, we sit at that chair, that's a stronghold. He says, and we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This, one, this version says, to obey Christ. Well, do you know what you're thinking? Because if you don't know what you're thinking, if you don't know your thoughts, it's going to be nearly impossible for you to take your thoughts captive and lay them before the cross of Christ, of the place of ultimate obedience. I need to create space in my life to think about what are my actual thoughts. And my thoughts are also indicative of what I'm feeling whether you're feeling sad or depressed or heart, or whatever it is you're feeling. Let me tell you, in this culture, we try to put feelings aside, especially men. That is a stronghold. When we're able to overcome that and said, what is it that I'm feeling inside? Then I can begin to ask the question, what am I thinking? And that's where I can come and say, God, if this means that I need a renewal of my mind, then I come to you, Romans 12. But before I can do anything that verse 5 says, I have to know what I'm thinking. I need to know my longings. Take inventory of our thoughts. Can you hear your soul's cry? Some of us have been living with this cry within our soul, and we've just stuffed it and stuffed it and stuffed it. And yet I believe that God wants to set it loose. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Let it cry. Hear it. And God will show up. God will direct it. But we've got to slow down just enough. Create those spaces that we can hear, because he wants us to experience his love, his fullness, his healing, his freedom in every area of our lives. And I know some of us here are terrified at slowing down enough to hear what's really inside, because we've become very comfortable with distraction. We like the hurried pace of life because we don't want to come in touch with what's really at the core of our being. We kind of know what's there. 
But God said, there's no place I have not been and will not go for you. So regardless of what that may be inside, I think that's the place where the Spirit comes and begins to move, where only the deep work of the Spirit begins to take place in our lives. And this road that we're invited into, it's a, it's a road of transparent vulnerability for us to be able to say, man, this is where I am. I know some of us think we got this, we got this. But the truth is you're drifting further and further away from everything God wants you to be. Our phones have a focus mode. I don't know if you all use it. I use it all the time. Mine lives pretty much on do not disturb. So somebody will leave me a voicemail and then they'll text me to tell me they left me a voicemail. I didn't get either one until I look at my phone. And then I have a sleep mode, activates and deactivates certain apps. I have a vacation mode. I like to put that one on just to throw people off. Um, <laughs> sends automated messages so I don't have to deal with it. But I wondered if for us if, if our souls had a focus mode. You know, my phone also has an off button. You should try it sometime. It actually works if you hold it down long enough. Wonder, we don't have a reset, so to speak. But I think we can reach a focus mode to find that pattern, that rhythm in our lives. And we're going to talk about that over the next couple of weeks. But we're not living just by default. This is just the way things have always been. But we're actually living by design. The way God intended us to live. I've been hearing over the last... Um, several years, how to slow down and remove distractions. It is really difficult. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is possible with some practice and with the Spirit's help. I haven't always liked what I found when I looked inside. We'll talk more about that in a couple weeks, but those places where you can say, man, I didn't know this was here, or I thought I dealt with this, but it's still rearing its ugly head and I haven't fully dealt with it God I need you to help me deal with it that's going to require us to slow down and focus a little bit church some of you are already doing it you're, you're pushing yourselves in to, to new groups We've got two Wednesday night groups going through the ruthless elimination of hurry it's a book by John Mark Comer we got men's bible study started up last week um, meeting right out here we had about 20 plus guys keep coming we got other small groups that are opening up for folks, whether you're married, couples, whatever, but women's Bible study. Find those places because it helps set the pace of different rhythm. And at that point, you begin to say, okay, what's really happening? I'm telling you, God is ready to move in our midst. He's ready to move in our souls. He wants a people that will slow down and focus on him. Let us pray. God, we thank you that in the midst of all the distractions in our lives and how hurried we move, you're a God of grace. And you, you meet us where we are. You don't demand perfection, yet in our messiness and imperfection, you meet us right there. In the messy middle of our lives where we live, you show up always. Lord, I pray you would give us the strength to slow down a little bit. The internal fortitude to focus. To hear the longings and cries of our heart that I think in there too, Lord, we're gonna hear you speak. We're gonna hear you move. Allow us, Lord, to identify the strongholds in our lives that have been built up over time about ourselves, about our bodies, about sex, about politics, about whatever it may be that stands against your word and your will so that we can be free, experience your healing, 
and be an encouragement to those around us. Shape us however you like, Lord. In your name we pray and ask all of this. Amen. Let us